turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta-learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. You're listening to episode 62 of the Humans 2.0 podcast with Marcus Aurelius Anderson. While preparing to deploy with the U.S. Army, Marcus suffered a severe spinal injury that left him paralyzed from the neck down. His life was turned upside down and after dying twice on the operating table, he was told he would never be able to walk or use his hands again. Days quickly turned into months and he was forced into life-changing soul searching. He discovered he was left with two choices. He could either be a victim or he could change his mindset. Having no other option, he began looking for any lessons to be learned from his injury and soon discovered that his adversity was a gift. He now speaks, teaches, and writes to inspire others to actualize their full potential and achieve their goals and aspirations. You guys do not want to miss this podcast episode. Marcus and I get into all sorts of different personal questions and it was a real blast if you enjoyed this i would highly appreciate heading over to itunes and leaving a review on the podcast because it helps the show grow in ways you can't even imagine enjoy marcus how do you spend your time here on planet earth on planet earth now that i have a second chance i am doing everything that i can to empower everyone that i come in contact with and help them see how strong they really are and help them live their life to the fullest potential through teaching, through speaking, through social media, any medium in which I can do so. I want to reach as many people as I can and help them reach their, their highest level. Awesome. So, Marcus, what, what was your first chance? Oh, my first chance was um, when I had the first chance at life for the first 40 years on this earth. And then I um, had kind of a bad day. I, I had a rough time of it. I got preparing to deploy with the military, I got injured and I was told that I would never walk again. I ruptured a disc in my neck and it paralyzed wow. me from the neck down. And uh, in the process of the operation, I uh, died on the operating table twice. So that, um, yeah, that was my first chance. But the good thing is I got a second chance and it really made me take a hard look at what I had done thus, thus far in my life at that point. And it really made me um, attack everything that I have now with more vigor and redouble my efforts in, in that capacity. Wow. Quite the, quite the warrior. Marcus, do you think that, you know, you know, oftentimes when I'm interviewing people or, you know, we hear these kinds of stories, you know, it's something along the lines of, you know, I had a life threatening injury. Um, I had a near death experience. I had a family death and then they kind of they have that decision they kind of break out their break out of their trance they have that decision and then they go for it do you think do you think you need that in order to make such a shift in in your life it's so hard mark because I, mm. that's what i'm trying to do now is just give people that that verbal kick in the ass while giving them a hug right after and showing them it's like i want you to to take the information that i've acquired from my experience and apply it to yourself now. So you don't need that adversity in your life. So you don't have to have your back up against the wall. But unfortunately the human condition is to be comfortable. So most of the time we need that adversity to kick us to, we need the universe to slap us in the face and to say, you know what, I'm trying to get your attention. I want you to look at this. And unfortunately pain and discomfort are the best teachers. And that's exactly what happens to most of us. So we have to have that urgency and, For better or for worse, adversity is the ultimate accountability because it doesn't offer you a second chance. It doesn't offer you the opportunity to say, can you come back later? It's like, no, it doesn't care about what you feel. It doesn't care about what you're going through right now. It takes everything you have. It it forces you to give it your your full undivided attention and actually do the work. And that's what it takes. So 
I'm trying to get that with as many people as I can, but it, it normally does take something big. It takes something to rock you to your foundation. And once that's happened, you have a decision to make, like you say. Hopefully the idea is to get their attention enough to where the decision that they make pushes them forward into that discomfort. And if they can embrace it voluntarily, they're going to make a lot more inroads to go where they want to go as opposed to doing just enough to get by and then having a midlife crisis or even a quarter life crisis, which is very common now. Yeah. And I, I definitely agree. And, you know, that's something I'm struggling with now too, not in terms of just in terms of trying to like get people to, you know, be more aware of their lives and, you know, really figure out if it's the direction it's going, you know, whether it's, under their will or, you know, subconsciously, like so many people, Marcus, do you think that, you know, as you said, adversity is one of the best training partners towards, you know, your life without a doubt. And it's much needed. You're going to, you're going to have to be kicked in the ball sometimes in order to go really high up. You know, I love that so much. And I, that, you know, that's what prompted me to, to invite you from, from LinkedIn when I found out, you know, because there's so many different people, you know, which is, I'm not saying it's bad or anything that talk about chasing after your goals and whatnot, but I just feel like overcoming adversity, that's something we're all, all of us are going to have to do. And the thing is that it's really hard, you know, like it, adversity is very relative and I don't think it, it makes sense to compare um, between other people's, but you know, there are some, there are some really terrible things, you know, like some really, really bad things. People have had unspeakable things happen to them and it's really bad. And, you know, I, thankfully for the most part, I've had a good life. Um, definitely some ups and downs, but I can't, you know, I can't even imagine what some people are going through right now. How do you, how do you, what, how do you approach that? Like if there's something going on in your life, that's just awful. And let's, let's say it's happening right now as we speak, like this isn't in the past. How do you go about this? How do you, how do you tackle this audacious thing? And it, just like you said, it's, it's really easy to say it. It's like a motivational quote. It looks great on paper and you, then you skim pie it, but you have to actually put it into action. That's where it gets tough. And that's why most people try to avoid it or circumvent it entirely. But what we have to do is, just like you mentioned in, in the, the question, adversity is relative. It's not a competition. Uh, some people will love telling you or complaining about their day and how bad they have it and blah, 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 blah. Um, there was a gentleman at the, the gym that was doing that to me every time he would talk to me. And finally, I just said, so what are you going to do about it? I didn't allow him to vent anymore. I just said, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do to change this? Because all I hear is you complaining, and what I hear is my happiness is not worth any inconvenience when, when you say that. That's what I hear you saying. So understand that if you're going to complain about something, that's fine. But if you're not actually moving towards changing it, then you're not doing anything other than polluting what's around you. So the, the great thing about adversity, not the great thing, but the thing about adversity is it forces you to be very, very specific about what you want. It's either something you want to get out of or somewhere you want to go. But how many people do we hear that say, oh, you know, I want to be happy or I want to be wealthy or I want to find success? Well, those things are great, but they're very ambiguous. So a, a goal is as attainable as it is specific. So if you say, I want to make X amount of dollars or I want to make this amount of impact on this many people or I want to sell this many or whatever it is, that's what makes you really, really find out what's important and what's specific. Um, and then, like you said, getting away from adversity or overcoming it. Understand that there is a, a scale of adversity is what I call it. So 10 is the worst thing you've ever been through in your life. And zero is like heaven on earth. And what I try to do is I try to get people to step outside of it and be objective, like in a third person standpoint and say, okay, the thing that you're facing right now on a scale of zero to 10, honestly, where is it? Lots of times when we do that, we look back and we realize we're usually at about a three or a four. And usually we're making it a little bit worse than what it really is because we're feeding into our own bullshit, right? So the idea is to call yourself on your own bullshit, make you take accountability, and then say, you know what? I've gone through a lot worse than this. I can do much more than what I'm doing now. So instead of you know dragging this out and trying to live for the weekend and hate Mondays, attack it, go after it right now. 
because you're going to have to go through it eventually. So the sooner you are able to press through it, the faster, the faster you get to the other side. And most of the time when we're through it, we look back and we go, you know what? That wasn't as bad as I thought it was. And there will be times when you are facing that 10. There absolutely are that times when you're facing the most difficult thing. But when that happens, realize that adversity is that catalyst that is going to force you to evolve into the person who can handle that. And now once you're through that, and now that you've had a chance to breathe and look at it objectively in the rearview mirror, now you can say, wow, maybe that was difficult, but look at how strong I got in the process. So if we look at adversity, like you say, as a partner, as a person that forces us to get better, we will grow from it. But if we see it as something that is oppressive and holds us down, then we'll probably be stuck right there in that development, wherever it is. And you're only as strong as the adversity that you overcome. So push through it, commit, and give yourself some credit. You're stronger than what you think you are. So act like it. Yeah, definitely. And I guess, you know, that's, it's perspective, you know, like the way that, that you look about that. And it's, it's, it's really hard because perspectives can be limiting, you know, and they're always delayed, right? Um, you know, you'll be in a new environment, but your old perspectives are, are holding you back and you're lacking that new perspective in order for you to do that next thing that adversity is trying to um, tell you. So, so I can share something with you. So right now I'm probably going through probably the, the most difficult adversity ever in my lifetime. I don't know if it's a 10 or not, but it's definitely the, the most difficult. There is that part of me that is, it is the catalyst. I'm like super, super motivated and I, I love it uh, like in, on some levels. And then there's kind of another part of me that is the much lower level, but sometimes he wins and it's kind of like, mm-hmm. Hey, Mark, you know, this is happening. Take it easy on yourself. Relax. And then I don't, you know, like I'm in this point where I'm like, should I just, you know, use that motivation as action to, to drive me forward? Or is this like a time where I'm like, all right, you know, this thing is happening. I don't want to, I don't want to push myself too hard because I don't want, I've never, you know, this is a new environment. I don't know what could potentially happen. What would you tell somebody that is, you know, kind of going through an adversity right now and they're maybe shifting between those two sides. If that makes that's sense. A good, yeah, and that's a good question because people are, are in that a lot. Before I answer that question, I, I want to address something. A lot of people are told that if we find our passion or if we find our purpose, that that will be everything that we need. And again, like I said, lots of times it's a, it's a vague notion. We understand that, especially in today's environment, you don't have to marry any profession. You can do what you're doing right now for five years, whatever that, whatever that you're in currently. And then that may lead you into another field or it may offer more opportunities or it may present other things that you may not see currently. But we have to go in that direction in order to see that path. Lots of times our careers are going to be multi- multifaceted and there will be mul- multiple things we'll be doing, sometimes simultaneously or sometimes for five years, 10 years. Go back to it again five years thereafter. So... Don't be afraid of committing to something with everything that you have and then understanding that maybe this isn't where you should be at the moment and then pivoting. Um, my, in my book, The Gift of Adversity, my squad leader was telling me that we were preparing to deploy and he says, you know what gets more men killed than IEDs and bullets? Indecision. Mm. And, and he was absolutely right. And it was a perfect example because right when we, right when we had gone through that training, one of our guys hesitated and he slowed down going through that door. And because he didn't hit the door with the intensity that he's supposed to, we all got stacked up and we're all stuck there. And now it takes one person with an AK-47 to kill everybody. Right? So indecision kills you, and, but it, more importantly, it kills your momentum and it kills your dreams. So don't let that happen. Um, usually we have to decide if what we want is more important than the hardship and the adversity that we're facing or if we're just simply trying to avoid that adversity, and this is the kind of carrot that we're using to do that. In the end, if the goal that you want is worth enough, you will overcome, you know, you'll single-handedly storm the gates of heaven or hell to get it if you want it. And also understand that it doesn't happen overnight, that it's okay to lose a battle, like to have to take a, a knee or take a break for a minute, and then reattack it, as long as you can win the war, that's what matters. People don't ask how you win. They just ask if you win. They don't see all that happens as an entrepreneur or as a podcast host 
or anything. They don't see all the stuff behind it. They don't see all the editing you do. They don't see all the rigmarole that you had to do just to, to have this conversation. They don't know how much longer you're going to be working on this. They don't understand about how you have to get the bio, how you have to do the extra work. There's a lot of it that goes into a 45 minute conversation. So understanding that process alone should give you a pretty good indication of, of where you need to go on the, on this thing that you're facing currently with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a young guy and based on like the failures and the, the difficulties that I've encountered before, those have been the best things ever to yes. ever have happened to me. You know, I think it's, I think part of you, you know, I've talked to like some, some psychotherapists about this. I've talked to some spiritual people about this, all, all sorts of different people. And, you know, your mind is trying, you know, your mind, your life, it, it knows the best thing for you. And it's trying to put you on this path. That's the best thing for you. You might not see it that way at first, but you need to go through the mud, you know, to come out on the other side. You know, Marcus, I got to ask you this. What do you, what's the hardest part in giving people advice? Because I, you know, I'm sure you, you talk about life a lot and giving advice, you know, depending on definitely depending on the subject, it can be hard and the nuances of it are really strange. But what, what's been the difficultest part for you? The most difficult part, especially when I'm coaching people is because as a coach, a lot of people just want to give you advice. Well, you should do this. You should do this. You should do this. But to be the best coach that I can, I need to do everything that I do from a place of respect, empathy, and love. And it's a delicate balance in all those things. So I need to make you feel safe enough to tell me what you feel you, what you really, really want to work on or what you're really facing. But then I also need to make you feel enough accountability to where I call you on it and say, listen, man, you know, we both know this is what you want. We both know this is what you need to do. So the hardest part is getting that person to be able to actually tell me what's going on. Anybody can give advice, but you have to sit there and ask that person and find out what's going on. Like you said, talk about their mindset, talk about what happened before you got on the phone with them or before you had the conversation and give them a chance to really kind of get that stuff out. Honestly, if you listen enough, people will tell you exactly what they want, what they need or what their problem is, but most people don't do that. So by talking to somebody and asking them, what do you find the most difficult part of this whole thing is? And then asking them that question and then getting to the, the next level of that and getting down to the common denominator. Once I'm there, that's when we can start doing the work. And for most people, it's a non, it's, it's a lack of belief on their own part. They don't think that they can do things. They don't either think that they're either worthy of it or they don't think that they can achieve it. And then mm -hmm. it be perpetuates and it becomes almost a victim mentality and it slows them down. What we have to do is we have to look at what we're facing, look at that adversity, look it in the eye, don't be afraid of it, say, I see you, I know you're there, I'm not afraid of you, and I'm going to push through you, and that's what you have to do. Um, adversity doesn't give a damn about your feelings, and it will ask you every single day if you want to quit. So every single day you have to make the choice to overcome it. Every single moment, every breath, you have to make sure that you are willing to push through whatever you're doing. And that's where priorities are key. Most people have a bunch of ideas of things they want to do, but they don't commit to anything. So once you become precise about exactly what you want, that's whenever the magic happens. So that precision is, is one. And then two, there is, there is something else that people don't have. And that's commitment. They have interest. They don't have commitment. There is but one level of commitment and that is total. And that's it. But if you allow yourself to go until it gets difficult and now you're like, nah, I'm not as committed. Well, you weren't committed in the first place. You were just interested. So the, there should only be a few things that are truly priorities in your life. And those are the things that are worthy of your best effort, all of your mental energy, all of your tenacity. Find something that is really worthy of what you can have to offer and then do not hold back. A lot of people, a lot of people I coach, a lot of people I talk to, subconsciously they hold back about 10% in the gas tank because they like having that as a default saying, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, they can say, well, I didn't really commit hundred mm. percent, but that last 10% is when the magic happens. That last 10% is when everything comes together and it just flows and you go through it. But getting to that last 10% is the difficult part. 
and adversity is what guards that. So do not allow yourself the chance to be weak. Don't let yourself have that opportunity to give up for just a second. Take a breather is okay because we can't go 24 seven. We can't be motivated, you know, every day of the week, but discipline is what has to take its place. Motivation is fleeting, but discipline is what gets us there. And by having discipline, people look at me and they, they're like, oh, well, you know, you've done all these different things. You know, I'm not special. I'm, I'm disciplined. But to a person who's undisciplined, that makes me look special. Mm. So understand what it is. Understand what you want to do. Commit. Make a plan. And then follow that thing through every day, even on the days you don't feel like it. Because when you keep going, even when it's difficult, that's when you know you're committed instead of interested. Yeah, and you you mentioned this really interesting concept. Um, you know, looking at the problem, taking responsibility. I think that's huge. Um, about you know a year and a half, two years ago, I kind of had a, a transformation, and I had got one of those whiteboards, and I wrote a three step process, and it was take responsibility, take action, find a way, and taking responsibility is is huge. I think it's I think it's a prerequisite to this. And it's because, you know, it I listened to I listened to the world's advice for the first 18 years of my life and it was, dude, it's not your fault, man. It's your, you know, it's your genetics, it's your family, it's your this, it's your that, you know, dude, don't worry about it, you know, cuz you know, even if you tried, you, you probably wouldn't you wouldn't even make a difference. So just like settle for something else, whether that's a school, a, a, a prescription for a drug, it, a thousand things. Um, and the moment when I actually took responsibility, everything totally shifted. And I think that's what it's about. It's about, you know, looking at your life and just taking responsibility for all the bad things, all the good things, because what I've learned is from that point on, all the great things you do, all the great things that you accomplish, it's also your fault. You know, it's your responsibility. And that's, and like once you get those under your belt and like, for me, that just keeps on driving me forward. It's like, you're just like making unlimited fuel, you know? That's That's absolutely it. The, the thing is, and again, laying in my bed at 40 years old, Mm. looking back on my life, that's what really made me take that look like you were talking about. I understood that I had done what everybody else had told me to do. So I'm, I'm 46 now. I'm, I'm quite a bit older than what you are. So my father's idea was if I have a bachelor, if he has a bachelor's degree, he thinks that the next thing I should get a bachelor's degree, actually more than that, I should get a master's or a doctorate, right? Because that's what, in his mind, education equates to success. So that's mm-hmm. what I was doing. I was doing more of those things. And then I realized after I was injured that a lot of the stuff that I was doing, I was doing for other people. I was doing to impress other people. I was doing to make them feel satiated or I was doing that because of some sort of dogma that I was adhering to for whatever reason. So what I had done is I did what everybody else was doing, which I went to college, got a bill of goods, got a degree, didn't like what I could do with that degree, even though I knew what it was before I got through it, changed to something else, started working at a job while I was still in school. The people that work at that job had the same mindset. They've been through the same thing. And now you're around those people. And those are the five people you're around. But not only the five people that you're around, but those are the five common mindsets that you're around. So if you're around mindsets that are about compromise, that are about not being satisfied, that are about taking the easy route, that are about distraction, that are about not being committed, guess what? That's what you're going to always have. But if you're around people that are committed, that are successful, that want you to win, that are not going to compromise in any capacity and are going to get there come hell or high water, guess what? That's what your average is going to be. So once you compromise, it it turns into a downward spiral of compromise and everything else. So the big lesson is don't compromise. Ask more of yourself, expect more of yourself. And guess what? The people around you will start expecting more of themselves because you're holding yourself to a certain standard. And if you're not leading by example, you're not really leading. So think about that whenever you're doing those things. Um, in the grand scheme of things, people may seem uncomfortable if you get out of that. Like we all came from the same place and now this guy thinks he's better than everybody else. It's not that at all, but it makes them feel uncomfortable seeing that you're no different than what they are. And uh, it shines a light on the fact that they aren't accomplishing what they want to do. But again, that's because they're in the community of compromise. Misery loves company, but not as much as mediocrity. So don't allow yourself to be mediocre. 
Yeah. Wow. And, you know, for some people, it, it might not necessarily be possible at this time in their life to, to change the people that they're, you know, we never know people's situation, but that's why I love things like podcasts. For example, you essentially get to curate your own reality. You know, you, you know, it depends. Like I get a lot of people talk about, um, you know, putting yourself in a bubble, maybe in a, in a bad way, but I don't think it's necessarily always a bad way. You know, I think if you're in an environment that, isn't serving you and it's not the best i think maybe it could be a good thing to put yourself in a in a positive um bubble um you know like sometimes i feel like you just need to tune everything out and you just need to focus and be introspective on yourself and something you you mentioned um about you know asking yourself I think that's that's huge. That's what probably led me on my path. Just starting out, just asking small questions like why, you know, why? And then eventually that 0.001% deviation, 10, I mean, one, two, three years down the road will lead you to a completely different frame of mind. Marcus, I got to ask you, when you were, when you were, ill and and your back was you know you couldn't move what was you know what was going through your mind at that moment you know were you go ahead oh no no it you know it i've been doing martial arts since i was 11 years old i've been trying to read about marcus Aurelius when i was 13 because having a name like i do it's impossible not to be curious uh and at 13 trying to read meditations it's like it, there's no way <laughs> But um, it made me ever cognizant of the, of the moniker, and I needed to understand what it was, which is why I think my grandfather gave me the name in the first place. He was very wise. So, um, but even with all that knowledge and even with the, the stoic mentality and the martial mindset, and I still had a lot of Taoistic and Zen kind of ideology, when you get injured and when it's facing you and you cannot escape it, that's when you really – you don't know what the hell you believe – because mm-hmm. everything that we have right now is like in this delicate vacuum. And it's all about, this is what I think would happen. Or, this is what I think I would do. Or, no, I know this is what I would do. But then when it actually happens, it's all different. You have no idea what you believe until you're up against it. And that's what I found. So I went through a lot of the, the stages of, of grief. I went through anger was the first one. And I was angry at everybody. But the person I was the most angry at was myself because... I spent 40 years of my life basically doing stuff other people wanted me to do and realizing that I was the damnable shame of it was that I had finally found out what I wanted to do and I had absolutely no ability to act on it. So Mm -hmm. we talk about framing and we talk about understanding, you know, having that, that different reference point or having that perspective. That's why I talk about it. My TEDx talk when I say, if you woke up tomorrow paralyzed from the neck down, what do you wish you would have accomplished with your life? And that gives you perspective immediately. And then the second question is always, you know, what would you regret? And then the third question is, if for some reason you were able to finally walk again, how would you live your life differently? And that's what I found myself doing. I was lying there and we all know we're going to die, but it's different when you're 40 years old and you know you may have another 30 or 40 years of life, but you're going to be paralyzed. So all the stuff that we have, they say that we don't know what we got till it's gone, but the reality is we know what we've got, but we just assume that we'll never lose it. And that's whenever we become complacent, we compromise and we take the path of least resistance. Mm. And then we get kicked in the ass by a, a real form of adversity. And now we're like, now what do I do? So I was very angry, and that anger I directed inwards, and it turned to depression. Um, I would have taken my own life if I was physically able, and I'm, I'm not proud of saying that, but I, that's, that's the truth. I found out that the people that are suicidal don't want to die. They desperately want to live, but they cannot find a reason or a purpose or a motivated, motivation to do that. So that's why they feel that the only way out for them, the only thing that they can control is to act on that. And if there's anybody listening to that, that listening to our voices right now and they're, they're going through that, talk to somebody, get some help. It doesn't even have to be a professional. If you can talk to a friend and just get it out, sometimes that's enough to help people. 
but I was in that very, very dark place. Um, and I was trying to find things to be grateful for. And uh, it just wasn't happening. I was grateful to be alive, you know, and I kept telling myself that, but I didn't feel like I was living. I just felt like I was, you know, breathing in oxygen and pushing out carbon dioxide. But what I did is I took myself out of the equation and instead of thinking about me, 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 and how I'm paralyzed and how my life sucks, I started thinking about, there's got to be a lesson in this. What is it? What am I missing? And I kept looking at it obliquely. And for about three months, I was in that place. Finally, I realized that the anger wasn't serving me. And I also realized the only thing that was good that came out of this was the people that, if this had happened while I was deployed, for example, because we were preparing to deploy, but I never got to go. And if I was deployed, I would have gotten at least the rest of my team in trouble, compromised because they would have had to bring me back. I would have got the medical people that were trying to save me in danger. I would have got the Chinook that would have tried to air vac me out in danger. So the beautiful thing was nobody else got hurt. And once I had that cornerstone, I could build on it. And then I became grateful for the bed I may never get out of and the room I may never leave because I knew that compared to where I was, or even compared to other people, I was still better off. And when I started taking that responsibility and I stopped buying my own BS, that's whenever my life shifted. A week after I started seeing my adversity as a gift instead of a curse, the fingers on my hand started moving a little bit. And you know, I never looked back ever since then. Wow, I love that so much. Hmm. Wow. That's great. You know, one of my, one of the best tools that I've learned in my inner skill set. Um, I think I learned this first from, uh, there's this guy, his name is Aubrey Marcus. Um, yeah. Do you know? Yeah. He's the CEO of on it. He has his own podcast yep. and you know, he kind of talks about adversity and this tool of seeing yourself in the future, looking back and you know going through something a difficult thing and then finding a gem like you you know you go under the cave you you embark in the dungeon you you get the jewel and then that jewel is kind of it's a it's a prism of light and you can use that to help other people that are in the same exact situation as you and you know there and then like when you start thinking about that you're like wow there's thousands maybe hundreds of you know there's infinite amount um and that to me is a, is an excellent tool. You mentioned um, stoicism and and Zen and what about uh, what about right now? You know, coming out of this experience, are you a stoic or do you kind of apply all of those things or how do you work those out? I apply all those things, but to me, philosophy is only as functional as it is useful to you. Yeah. So some people use philosophy almost like a religion, and it's this again almost like a dogmatic ideal, but. Mm. I, I would encourage anybody to explore any philosophy or any belief or any religion that they, they feel resonates with them. But I would caution them on this. Do not use it as a crutch because every religion, every philosophy, if you look in it, there are justifications for compromise. There are justifications for giving mm. up on your dreams. And then you'll have people that will put their arm around you and coddle you and say, that's okay. We gave up on our dream too. And here's the justification for it in this writing or this person's words or whatever. Don't buy into that. Do not buy into that. Don't use it as a crutch. Don't use it as an excuse. Uh, the Stoics and the Taoists, I love the idea that they have, which is to endure what is endurable. But people take that the wrong way. They think it means that I should just, well, this, this, uh, this situation sucks, so I'm just going to endure it. Yes if there's no other choice and if you cannot change it. But if it's something that's within your power to change in any manner, then by all means do that. Because now whatever you do to change that situation will give you a better opportunity to get to a better situation. And instead of just sitting there saying, well, I hate my job. It's Monday morning. This sucks. Yay. You know, it's, it's Friday. If you do that, then you're just going to get into this cycle. And then before you know it, you're 22 before you know it, you're 32. Before you know it, you've made decisions based on compromise. You marry somebody based on compromise. What's the next thing you do when you're married? Well, let's have a kid. And all of a sudden, you have a life of compromise and you have no opportunity to do the things that you wanted to do. It's ironic because people are afraid to do the hard work, the, 
the uncomfortable work of self-evaluation initially and they want to kick it down the road. But what they end up doing is they end up just elongating that suffering Mm. for the rest of their lives. And then by the time they figure out they want to act on it, many times it's incompatible. They can't make it happen because there are too many other things happening. So philosophy is great, but understand that a philosophy is only as good as it serves you. And another reality that you have to face is that there is no one person's idea, philosophy, or beliefs that I adhere to 100%, including my own as I evolve, because there is always going to be an exception to the rule. There's always going to be a hot button ideology. So if you look on the left, right, whatever the, the philosophy is, both sides are going to have some answer to that, that question. So instead of deciding that you have to like Coke or Pepsi or Bud Light or Miller Light, don't do that. Just look at a higher view and say, what's the problem? What is the best way to answer this problem? And what is the best way to do it without having any kind of like dogmatic affiliation? Because those things don't serve you. Figure out what you're trying to do. Put the human back in humanity and understand that that's what you're trying to make happen and then act on that without, don't worry about the repercussions of other people's opinions because in the grand scheme of things, their opinions mean nothing at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, people following down this path, the pathway, and then they just start, you know, doing things, the brain goes on default, you know, next thing you know, you're like, you know, doing this random thing that you'd never think you'd be doing. And yeah, but um, I, I absolutely love what you said. And I, I 100% agree with you. And I think, you know, life's very nature is paradoxical and it's highly dependent on perspective. So there really is no straight shot, um, you know. So it, it, to me, that kind of goes back to, to self-awareness. You know, if you know yourself, then you'll be able to, to apply those new perspectives to me. Marcus, what do you, you know, do you have any kind of, hmm, I don't want to say like tips or tricks or hacks or anything, but do you have like any sort of uh, anything? I I love what you said about when you were on your bed and and you thought of all those people that didn't get hurt as like the light. I absolutely love that. Do you have anything kind of similarly like that to, so people can kind of apply it in their own life if it's like a... A, a trick or or maybe something to to help them out of a of a rut help them to change perspective absolutely i mean we talked about the the 10 scale before the adversity scale mm-hmm. um right now gratitude is a very big thing everybody talks about being grateful and they they have gratitude um and i'll i'll challenge them with two things one is people will sometimes if they journal or if they just get up and they do their affirmations and they'll think about three things to be grateful for. Um, or maybe they do at the end of the day. Some people do it night and day, whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, when you're brushing your teeth, if you're thinking about the things that you're grateful for, think about something that you overcame. Think about an adversity that you overcame that day. And it doesn't have to be huge. It may be that you didn't eat that, that sugary donut. Or it may be that you went to the gym even though you didn't feel like it. And even if it was a crap workout, at least you went. By doing that, that that does two things. That programs you to realize that, yeah, you can overcome this stuff. And these are like the micro adversities that you can put into into play every day. The other thing, which is a lot harder, but I want to challenge everybody that can hear my voice to do this. Gratitude is not something that you get to cherry pick. You do not get to be grateful for this part, but you're not grateful for this part. So you need to be grateful for all of it. If I can be grateful for the guy that hit me in traffic, or the fact that you know a business deal fell apart, if I can be as grateful for that as I can for the sunshine or a loving relationship or positive things that happen to me, by doing that now, I can take everything that happens to me and I'm bulletproof from a 360 degree angle. Nothing can get to me because I can take everything. I can take the positive from it no matter what the source is. So what I would say is be grateful for everything and absorb truth regardless of the source even if it's somebody that you don't like what they have to say even if their political affiliation or whatever it is understand that if they have a gem of knowledge or some truth absorb that you don't have to agree with everything that they say but take what you can because in the grand scheme of things they don't really care about what your other belief system is or not take what you can from them use that 
Use it to serve you so that you can serve others better. Bruce Lee says, I absorb what is useful, I discard what is useless, and then I add what is specifically my own. And a less eloquent way, eloquent way that he used to say it was, I use whatever works, I don't care where it comes from. And that should be the entrepreneurial mantra in today's day and age. If you have an opinion about click funnels, good or bad, but you have a way to use them, by all means, do it. If you have a person that you can network with, absolutely do that. But don't, you know, don't judge it too much. Understand what your outcome is, is supposed to be and then go to that outcome. But you know, gratitude is key, but take all of it. Don't just give a little bit of it. Don't just take the parts that are, that are really things that you like at the moment because life isn't like that. And if you don't have the, the mindset to overcome adversity before you get to it, it's going to be tough. I, I even had it before I got where I was and I still had a hard time. So it's not always easy and it's not supposed to be. If whatever we were trying to accomplish was easy, we wouldn't respect it. So understand that adversity is an indicator that you're on the right track. Marcus, that's awesome. And, you know, Marcus, you, you wrote a book, um, The Gift of Adversity, Overcoming Paralysis and Pain to Find Purpose. I love that title so much. Marcus, what is your your purpose? And do you think it's going to change in the future and adapt? I think it will always evolve, but the essence of my purpose is to help others, you know, uncover their strengths and uncover the, the purpose that they have within their, um, empowerment is huge. And having that empowerment is what allows you to take the steps. Being empowered allows you to fall down and not really care about it. It helps you brush yourself back off and, and try again. But if you just live in this, this place where you're afraid to do anything or you're more concerned about everybody else's opinion, then you'll never get anything done. So my, my purpose to, is to help other people become emboldened, to break outside that, and then to embolden other people all the way down the line. The way I look at myself is I'm a teacher, first and foremost. And so if I help one person, that's great. But if I can help them so that they can create more people that are leaders and teachers, that's, that's the idea. If I give a man a fish, I, I, teach, I give him a fish for a day. If I teach him to fish, that's great. But if I can teach him to teach others to fish, I've done my job. Change of the world, Marcus. What's the best way for people to connect with you? They can find me at MarcusAureliusAnderson.com. It's all one, all one word. It's just my name. If you want to find me on LinkedIn, I'm there. I'm on Instagram under the same handle, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Uh, if you want to book me to speak, I, you can go to my website. If you want to become a coaching client or, or do a consult, you can reach me there and do that. And if you want to buy my book, you can find it on my website or if you go to Amazon.com. And uh, I, I really appreciate your time, and I'm honored and humbled to be here, Mark. I really appreciated the conversation. It's been enlightening. Definitely. And all those links will be down below in the show notes. Uh, final thing, Marcus, I just want to acknowledge you. You know, this show is called Humans 2.0. And I got to say, man, you're definitely a human 2.0. I think you, you offer a, uh, you know, a no bullshit kind of, you know, hey, this is life. Let's deal with it so we can get on with it and, and maybe improve it and help everyone else out that's maybe worse off than us. And, dude, Marcus really isn't going to have anything on you. You know, I, I, I could definitely tell. Marcus, final, final thing, I promise. Uh, I've been asking my guests to, to leave the audience with a, a self-inquisitive, broad question out there to, to ask themselves to maybe keep in their mind for the rest of the day or, or, to, or however long they remember this for. Do you, do you have a question you want to ask the audience? Yeah, the, the easy question is, um, what do you want? Yeah. Um, you know, what do you really want? Define it, get real specific, use whatever metric you can to, to find that. If you want to talk about happiness, what is happiness? Define that. Is it a relationship? If you're talking about being financially successful or being financial freedom, what is that? Define that. The sooner that you can make a laser-like focus on that, the much sooner you will acquire it because not only will you see what it is, but your body will start to make that happen more often. Figure out what you really want. And if it's not what you want, chuck it away, man. Get rid of the superficial. You don't have time for that. Life is too short. Go after, figure out what you really want and go after that and let everything else fall away. Marks Rulius Anderson, 
Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This has been your host, Mark Metry. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.